Uh, yet I was telling you it wasn't giving you any choice, so it's just a proxy for uh, something you've been forced to do. And the reason for that is I want you to understand that if you accept that argument about it being about transitions, which I believe it is, uh, and if you layer onto that being not given the space or time to kind of decide whether it's for you or not, then you've got something called enforced change, which is probably the largest category of change that people find most difficulty with. And the formula, the, the flow I'm going to show you now is the flow that I would be using if I was coaching someone in bereavement counselling, because that's what it's like. It's like loss. It's like grief. And this is how it goes. So most people will feel themselves going through these, can, not necessarily in a linear way. You might come in at different stages. So the point is not, isn't that clever? Because it's actually well written up this. The point is, so what? So the answer is, whether it's you for you or you for others, then you need to get people to grudging awareness and reluctant experimentation as soon as you can. And if you're going to do that smartly, you don't allow them to go into denial, or not for long. So your job becomes creating spaces where people can talk it through, think it through, hit the table if they need to hit the table, vent their feelings, rather than, as many organizations do, button it up or leave the decision-making process so vague and late that everybody's in a state of anger, yeah? And typically that's what political groups do. They leave you, they tell you there's a vague direction of travel, and they normally in England, in education, tell us the day before schools break up what the decision is going to be. Ruining summer holidays for principals and uh, generally hacking off the rest of the... Any of that resonate with you? No, let's not go there. Okay, so... Um, I need to accelerate now, um, and this is funny, because the third point I want to make is that we need to slow down. If you've been to England, you will have seen uh, 20 years ago on the M25, if you've driven around the M25, heaven help you, um, the advent of variable speed limits. Variable speed limits simply means sometimes um, uh, somebody clever will be looking down like God and noticing that if we could do the less of the stop-start and more let's all drive at 40, we'd actually drive faster, which is indeed what has happened. Okay? You may not believe it. I know it's contestable, but uh, uh, scientists of traffic flow tell us that it is the case. Robert Sternberg said that intelligence is knowing when to act quickly and knowing when to think and act slowly. So it's not just about slow is good and fast is bad. It's just that if we never have slow, that's not helpful. Um, there's lots of good stuff about this, but let me just try one thing on you. How many of you ever feel any of these things? a sense of not quite meeting your goals, <laughs> difficulty in getting organized or even getting up in the morning, <laughs> too many projects going on at the same time and not being properly seen through, a restless search for excitement coupled with low tolerance for boredom, <laughs> easy distractibility, a tendency to drift in and out of conversations or reading resulting in considerable confusion. And probably I could add playing with your BlackBerry mobile phone or other accessory whilst apparently having three other meaningful conversations with your <laughs> colleagues. These are the symptoms of what, colleagues? Life in the 21st century? Attention deficit disorder, they are the symptoms of when you're looking at kids. They are the symptoms of our lives, aren't they? Partly because we don't slow down enough. We don't, as Stephen Covey has, he has a lovely uh, image of pressing the pause button in your life. Uh, I have a little, a little exercise in here saying, letting the phone ring in your life. Giving yourself at least a morning or a day when you don't, and especially turning off that irritating beep that says you've got another email arrived. Turn the flipping thing off, you know. Otherwise, you are in a state of uh, adrenal anxiety, are you not? So there's something about slowing down. Uh, if you're interested in that, um, my colleague Guy Claxton has written extensively a lovely book called uh, Hair Brain Tortoise Mind, uh, which if you wanted to go deeper on that, you could. Rules four and five overlap. Um, they are about the way we see the world and mindset and our, uh, the way we tend to uh, blame others and the way, as Apollo 13 discovered, Houston, we have a problem, but actually a problem that they overcame by building, using the simulated equivalent of that uh, and repurposing almost every item of equipment, getting very cold in the process because they had to save power. So these are about what's in our, these are, if you like, the heart of what I'm saying, which is what the OECD, OECD calls adaptive intelligence. In the recent work they've been doing, uh, they, they think, and I agree with them, 
that of all the dispositions or habits of mind we might want our kids to have most, to be most effectively able to do, then adaptability is top of that list. And if you believe that, well, Charles Darwin would be very happy, wouldn't he? Because that's what he was telling us. He wasn't saying big, strong um, survival of the fittest. He wasn't saying that. That's the outcome, but you have to define fit. And fit is, uh, has got a social con connotation here as well. So um, in an educational sense, uh, again, last time, so I won't explore it now, we talked about how the mindset of the learner is probably the single biggest thing we have some leverage with at the moment. And uh, far from every time, dull, I think of something, you know, the old stuff pops up in my brain, we know from the people I was talking about earlier on, people like Carol Dweck and Lauren Resnick, that if I focus on people praise here on in, that's not going to help. But if I start noticing specific, specifically what activity you're doing, whether you're an adult or a child, it will help. We know this from coaching. We know this from teaching. We know this from psychology. So it's no good saying, well done, Bill, another A grade, or well, bad luck, Bill, another G grade. Because that's just communicating something that seems relating standards to me and my personality. I need to know specifically what I have done that I might do less of or more of. What I have done that I could do differently. That's how I will grow. So there's a major mindset shift that schools and colleges and universities and community groups are putting into practice with fabulous results right now. Or at the practical end too, Martin Seligman coming at a, from a positive psychology perspective, uh, uh, how many are familiar with his concept of learned optimism? Learned optimism is the opposite of learned helplessness. Yeah? And uh, he's noticed how so many kids and big kids and small adults and big adults have a brittleness about them which brings a lack of resilience because they don't account for, they don't explain stuff that happens in a way that is helpful. Pessimistically speaking, if your explanatory style is pessimistic. When something goes wrong, you think it will always go wrong. So the photocopier goes wrong, you think typical photocopiers always go wrong. When the local authority or the district or the school lets you down, typical, that school always lets me down. Yeah? When you don't manage to get the last bus home, typical, uh, buses always let me down. You can generalize out over time. Personalization is the victim thing, isn't it? Typical. Last buses never stop for me. Funny that, isn't it? You know, they, they, they running the same time for everybody else, but etc. And pervasiveness in educational terms is, is toxic, isn't it? Because I have a bad experience in one subject, one domain in my life, and it washes across the others. This is really important in the TAFE world. I've been doing a lot of work on practical and vocational learning recently in the UK, uh, which is making some waves. And we know how we're dealing with the first, the first, uh, the, de the developed countries of the world are pretty hopeless to uh, almost to a nation in dealing with that anywhere between 10 and 50% of their citizens for whom a academic shaped experience is on offer. So we need to think that, about that too. Um, no one can make you change is rule six because we're all human. We have values, we have hearts, we have spirits and we live by those. That's true but we also know that some people are kind of better at it. So it may be interesting to know who those are. Um, I, I guess we at one stage thought that the alchemists were the kind of people who could change base metal into gold. Well, the new alchemists, according to Charles Handy, the British management writer, have three characteristics. People who are really good at getting other people to change tend to be, they all begin with the letter D, dedicated, dogged, and different. And the last one is almost the most important, I think. That's to say they're not judged by whether they're liked or not. They, they, that, that, they, they, they go hang on that. They're not fussed about that. They often are liked and often are admired. But they are determinedly different and they don't get sucked into groupthink. Now, at one stage, um, uh, we've all moved house and we've all found, this is going to make a connection with an earlier slide, we've all found something that we don't like. Let's say it's, a, I don't know, a piece of wallpaper like that or, a, uh, I don't know, can, can you think of something you really didn't like when you moved into a new flat or a house? So everybody got something in your sights, okay. Um, and the little voice in the back of your head says something like this, doesn't it? That has got to go, you know, or, or the equivalent of that. Um, and uh, then life carries on and you move your stuff in and you get settled and a month later you find yourself of an evening, maybe a Friday evening, sitting down with your nearest and dearest and you're 
having a nice meal together, and a little voice is just kind of rising up in the back of your head. And you hear yourself say, and before it's got out of your mouth, you, you, you're ru ruining the day. Um, Do you know what, darling? That wallpaper is beginning to grow on me. Ah! And you have fallen victim of the mere exposure effect, which is the coinage of Robert Zahonk, Z-A-J-O-N-C, if you like these things, and Googling these things, who found that far from familiarity breeding contempt, as the proverb has it, familiarity breeds content. So if you want to change stuff, put yourself in a safe situation where you can explore it, is the moral of that. And if you want to create situations to do that, as Charles Handy said, there will be some attributes that help. Nearly there. There's a funny formula that David Gleischer came up with, which is really helpful here. Because, of course, it is smart to resist sometimes, isn't it? And here are, here are the uh, Luddites showing their distaste for the new technology in the 19th century and earlier. Um, and I guess I suppose that's one way. You know, we don't like what the... Uh, states doing in some regard of our life would go and smash them up. Well, you, okay, I suppose you could do that, but it's not very thoughtful and not really going to uh, uh, do you well. So Glacia says, well, actually, no, but let's get under the skin of what it is that makes resistance so that we can, when we need to, think how better we can persuade people to change. And he says there are three components. They are being able to state the D for dissatisfaction with the status quo. So if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, articulate what's broke. V is the vision thing, unsurprisingly. We're going heading over there. You know, this, we've got to do this. That we have to shift learning so that all parties are involved in it, and we have to engage with business and, and philanthropics in a new way, would be an example. F is the bit that's often missed out. F is first steps in realization of the vision. All of that has to be in place if you want to overcome R, which is resistance to change. So... It's a useful thing to do this as a mental exercise. I often, when I'm faced with something that isn't working, I just what I've got to do on a Monday morning, and can I articulate what's wrong with the status quo? If I can't do all three of those, can't put a tick in all three of those, then the visionaries will follow me, whatever I do, providing I've got the V thing. The pra pragmatic practitioners will follow me, providing I think it's not bonkers, unless if I've got the what to do on a Monday morning. But nobody will follow me, at least rationally not follow me, unless I've got positional power, unless I can articulate what's wrong with the status quo. So we're there, or very nearly there. George Shaw, Shaw George Bernard Shaw puts this very amusingly in a kind of testament to the laggards, I think. Uh, and there is a sense in which it's dangerous as a leader if you don't heed the dissenters. I think, you know, you could, this could be kind of almost develop its own rah-rah groupthink if we weren't careful. So it's really, I mean, you know this, whenever you've worked with a sophisticated colleague, they're always still, even when you think they should close it down, they're often saying, well, you know, I'd just like to listen to Jane, or I'd just like to, because, uh, you know, they want to honour the fact that there may be something they've not thought of, which isn't dissent, it's just difference. And being able to make that distinction is really important. And finally, of course, we're in a collaborative world. And this, I think, seems a really good point to end on, given the network that we're part of. Uh, and uh, as was being said earlier on, you know, it's about, um, it's about collaboration, it's about uh, partnership work, and we're in a, as it were, flat world where there are six and sometimes fewer degrees of connection between us. So Alec Browers put it like this, we're in an era where the ideas of a single person alone seldom lead to fruition. All ideas originate with individuals, but their ideas must fit in with a matrix of innovation before progress is made. The Hadron Collider, the great breakthroughs in DNA, these have not been the stirrings of an individual mind. They're collective, aren't they? So that, back on the savannah, um, pre-zebras probably, but evolutionarily speaking, it wasn't the survival of the selfish fittest, it was the survival, uh, survival, survival, of the collaborative fittest. So I've got some food in my cave, you haven't, I'm going to share it with you. That's a kind of reciprocal anticipation that the thing may flip round and next month you may have food and I may not have food. So the reciprocity principle is very strong in us too. Um, anybody knows that who's been to a restaurant just before you pay the bill. You're often given a chocolate, aren't you? Yeah, it used to be in Britain. Used to be given an after eight mint, which always struck me as curious. Really, so just a lovely, rich-tasting meal, 
and, and a rather crude mint now to... But the, the point is not that. The point is, I'm giving you something, and the science of that particular transaction says, you'll give me a bigger tip as a result. Now, this could be prone to abuse, couldn't it? We could go around conferring presents on all sorts of people. In fact, there's a lovely experiment, which I haven't got time to tell you about, about sending out Christmas cards to people you don't know and being astonished that people send them back to you. <laughs> Dear Bill, lovely to hear from you, mate. Well, there we go. Um, so there's a really strong social argument here, and I think that's probably what brings us together, isn't it? Here are a group of people. We're all different, but I'm imagining, I'm hoping that the change we're about here and that the Expansive Learning Network has put so much work into is about bringing together a range of stakeholders to, to look at the, are the lines still the same? To look at that conundrum carefully and thoughtfully and try and make some headway. So remember, there are eight rules there. They're not rules. They're precepts for which there's some good evidence. And the ninth rule is go make up your own rules and uh, think about what you'd like to do. Or if not that, uh, my strong suggestion is you resort to prayer. Um, this is a rather cunning prayer because it has the seeds of good change management. If you spend your whole life fretting about those things that you have no influence over, you will go bonkers. Send, send for the, um, you know what I mean, okay? But if you just say, do you know what? I'm going to categorize this. That's, I, I have the foggiest what's going to happen. I'm not going to worry about it. Here I have, and in the middle, I'm going to tend to try to surface as much, notice as much, back to my first point, and share as much about the status of what we think we know. Next year, we're going to be, I know we're going to have this, not sure about that, and this, you know, is, hey, so uh, much tied up with the Gomsky re reforms that I, you know, don't know whether there's going to be an R in the month or not. Okay? So what I want to leave you with, and the conversation for those of you who choose to stay, will be, could you use any of this? And if so, how would you make it yours? And if you've liked any of that, then do have a play on the Expansive Education Network site, Lots of free materials from our university site to download. And if you like the, the kind of uh, the model of expansive education, then like Art Costa and Benacalic's Habits of Mind work, which is used quite a lot, I think, in Australia. So my colleague Guy Claxton's Building Learning Power is also a practical example of how you can do this in education systems. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>